Associate Minister of Transport, Julianne Genta, is with me now. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you for joining us today. Let's talk about the article that was in the Weekend Herald Saturday morning, written by Wellington businessman Troy Bowker, questioning the real environmental impact of electric vehicles. If we have a quarter of a million EVs in New Zealand by 2023, as is your target, if we're doubling each year from now on, starting from a base of about 16,000 that we have at the moment. So if we have 250,000 EVs by 2023, we're going to have a major battery disposal issue by the early 2030s. What's your plan to safely dispose of them? Well, I should start by saying you know, it was the previous government's target, and uh, we're looking at whether or not that's the appropriate target. But it's really important because the biggest waste issue associated with vehicles and the you know over 4 million vehicles we have in the country is the fuel that they run on, fossil fuels dangerous for the climate. We've agreed with all the other major countries in the world to reduce that. And EVs are one way that significantly reduce that. Now, uh, the last government actually looked at the overall emissions and waste issues associated with EVs versus fossil fuel cars. And there's an official independent report. Um, the article at the weekend said no one had looked at this. And I think uh, the businessman who wrote it, who's an investor in fossil fuel exploration and production, uh, didn't really do his homework before he wrote, he wrote that article because you can go on the ECO website uh, and at the end of 2015, there was a life cycle analysis that concluded that overall, um, electric vehicles produce 60% fewer emissions than petrol vehicles, including the emissions produced during manufacturing. There's no significant difference in the use of rare earth metals between electric cars and fossil fuel powered cars. And in fact, lithium ion, which is used in the batteries for EVs, is neither a rare earth nor even a precious metal. Now, I, you know, sure. Yeah, but that's not the question, Julian. We're talking about disposing of them after uh, about eight years of life, which is when they need to be moved on and replaced. Uh, Where do you get that eight year figure from? Well, it seems to be the. The the article and also other research I've done, some other uh, articles suggesting that the the life of even a Tesla, uh, the battery life of a Tesla might only be 10 years. Well, I think that possibly your sources are not the most reputable. I mean, there's no question that the fossil fuel industry is putting out a lot of confusing fake news about EVs, trying to scaremonger and suggest that somehow they have worse environmental impacts than fossil fuel cars, which is pretty absurd. And we already know. Yeah, but are you are you questioning hybrid, the fact that batteries last forever? They don't last forever, but they can be repurposed at the end of their life for other purposes. So, and and they do last on on average longer than eight years. When so, you I mean, say repurposed, cars. does that mean recycled? Well, they can actually be repurposed and used again as batteries, like for. Um, storage for solar panels, et cetera. It's, it's actually much easier to recycle batteries and, and keep using the useful parts of them than it is other parts of vehicles. Now, arguably, after the fossil fuels that are running them, the biggest waste and environmental issue associated with cars is the tires. And we actually have a major tire disposal problem here in New Zealand. Um, and, and that is the thing that I would be worried about. And already the Ministry for the Environment is working on that. They are also in the Ministry for the Environment, to answer your question, is working with the industry to ensure that there is a product stewardship scheme that will increase the recovery and reuse of the materials in the batteries. And that, as I said, you, they can be repurposed. They can be used for in-home energy storage. Um, they can also be used... Um, they can be shipped to specialist offshore recycling facilities. But, yeah, but hang on, if we do all, that, that's just, just shifting the problem right somewhere else, though, isn't it? Well, but really the idea that this is a bigger problem than climate change or a bigger problem than 4 million vehicles right now in New Zealand running on fossil fuels that all have tires that need to be replaced every five years, which just pile up in New Zealand, are covered in volatile organic compounds, have very limited scope for safe repurposing. I, I just think that this is... Have you not heard of retreads? We recycle our tyres all the time. Well, uh, look into it, do your research. Yes, it is possible to repurpose them. Um, and we did for a while have some factories in New Zealand that were making um, out of car tyres um, that stuff that goes into playgrounds. But actually there are health issues associated with that. They're not um, toxin-free after their life. And there are, there are major issues um, with the disposal, and everywhere around the world is having this issue with tires. So, so are you, to, are you no suggesting question. that we have our car tires made of something else besides rubber? 
Um, what I am suggesting is that there's a lot of misinformation out there that is actually funded by the fossil fuel industry. Um, it's designed to confuse people, to make them concerned, to make them worried. We have a major climate crisis. We have to act on that. We have to have practical policies in place. The problems that you're raising can be dealt with. And, and there are environmental challenges associated with cars. And, and that's why it's really important that Ministry for the Environment is focused on um, waste. It's not just with cars. I mean, there's lots of different waste issues. And so we do need to focus on that because we want to have a circular economy. We don't want to be manufacturing things that we only use for a few years. And that's okay. Will, will, will you accept that cobalt is an absolutely essential and important vital part of an EV battery? Um, I don't believe that's true for every type of EV, EV battery, but um, there's no question. That so you're saying that we can have EV batteries doing, without cobalt? There's, there's no question that whatever products we're using, whether it's for cars or EVs or anything else, we want those to be ethically sourced. Um, and my understanding is that the car manufacturing industry and the battery uh, manufacturers are aware that there are some issues with the mining of cobalt. But so, it, some issues, some issues. Most of it is mined by child labor. Well, again, that sounds like another fake news that's been circulating on Facebook. I think that's where you saw well, that. Well, I think so you'll you find that there was a documentary produced by CNN only three years ago, which went to the Congo and found that they, they had pictures of the child laborers working, getting the cobalt out of the ground. The question is that the majority that's available. Are there other ways? Is it possible to mine things ethically? And should we be championing that? Should we be ensuring that products coming into New Zealand or even around the world are produced ethically? Absolutely. And that's why I'm in politics, because I believe in doing that. And I know that most New Zealanders want to do the right thing. They don't want to drive a car that's polluting. They want practical solutions that make clean cars more affordable for them. And that is exactly what this government is doing alongside the work that we need to do to make sure that we're recycling the waste materials that um, occur after the lifetime, which is much longer than eight years. But um, whether it's tires, whether it's batteries, whether it's other parts of the car, of course we want to reuse that. And that's why the Ministry for the Environment has this work stream on product stewardship. And I think it's really, really a great thing. And these okay, are all so, opportunities. I mean, yeah. basically the transition to a clean, green, sustainable economy is a massive economic opportunity. It's one that New Zealand can be a leader in. Uh, but, you know, we've got to have the government show leadership. And the last government says they're enthusiastic about EVs. They did some of this. They set the targets. They wrote the report. Um, but they didn't actually do anything to make it easier for people to access them. And okay, so, so, so Gillian, under, under United Nations conventions, we have an obligation. Let's get back to where the cobalt is coming from. We have an obligation to ensure the supply chains of imported goods are not from child labour exploitation. So can you guarantee that we will follow that UN convention? What can you do as a politician to ensure that no cobalt mined by children is imported into New Zealand in EV batteries? Well, absolutely. I don't, whether it's an EV batteries or anything else, I think that we need to have fair trade at the top of our agenda. I mean, of course, we don't want child labor, whether it's producing, you know, the clothing that we're buying in uh, stores um, on, the, on the high streets of New Zealand, or whether it's mining cobalt and batteries. And there are options. It's not the majority. There are, <laughs> there, there's work that is being done right now to ensure that we have ethical production. And whether that's an EV or whether it's for solar panels. Their batteries are in everything, and we need to produce them sustainably and ethically, absolutely. But I think, again, there's all of the scaremongering about EVs, where it's coming from, just like that article on the weekend, which was not accurate, it was not researched, it, there were no citations. This is the fossil fuel industry fighting the inevitable transition to clean energy. And what New Zealanders want is a clean and stable climate for their kids. That's okay, so want, so do you realise that there is a worldwide shortage of the metals needed for batteries, in particular lithium, according to an article, and this was reprinted from the Telegraph in London, some research suggesting that the, uh, the amount required of lithium uh, by 2028 and say approximately 10 years will be 650,000 tonnes short. There'll be a 6,000 tonne shortfall of cobalt even by 2023. So this has and, been researched also, based on, on world capacity. And doesn't that mean the EV manufacturing industry could be in trouble because of a, a, mere, a, a shortage, a considerable shortage of the important materials for the batteries? Have you heard that all of the scientists involved in the intergovernmental panel, which is extremely conservative, 
have published research that says we have 11 years left to use fossil fuels. And how do you think that we're going to transition to an economy that allows people to live the good We have 11 have years right left now. of oil. Is that what you're saying? 11 years before to use fossil fuel at the rate that we're using it at. at. So, so it's not that it's not left. It's that if we put more into the atmosphere, we will have an uninhabitable, disastrous climate chaos. Do you believe that the vast generation. majority of the population believes that, that the world is going to be un, uninhabitable, unlivable in merely 11 years from now? Um, it's not that it will be in 11 years from now. It's that from that point on, the more fossil fuels we put into the atmosphere will lead to a chain of events that we cannot control and that will then become extremely problematic. This is mainstream. This is like every country in the world signed up to this. Barack Obama. China. Well, apart from China and the United States. The national, the national, no, China and, and Barack Obama were at COP21 uh, in 2015, as was our prime minister at the time. And we all, all the countries in the world agreed that the scientific evidence around climate change is irrefutable. So um, <laughs> what we need now are practical solutions. And I believe that we can have clean vehicles um, and we have to be responsible about how we use those resources. There are no greater environmental challenges with EVs than there are with petrol cars. In fact, it's fewer, but we still need to be responsible. You're absolutely right. I'm 100% with you on that. There should not be any child labor. And, of course, we, fair trade should be at the priority of our agenda because children shouldn't be forced to work in horrific conditions to produce any of the consumer goods that we get. Julian, while we have you here, the New Zealand Transport Agency's current forecasts, according to Treasury, say that the National Land Transport Fund, the NLTF, uh, may be nearly fully committed over the next 10 years once investments in rail are taken into account. Does this mean, really, that there will be no major roads built in New Zealand for the next 10 years? No, that's ridiculous. I mean, the $9 billion of the... 14 billion that we have that we're spending on transport over this three-year NLTF and NL, National Land Transport Program, which is funded by the NLTF, which you referred to, is going on roads. So, um, but I you're not building that, any more new roads, significant new roads, are you? So the last government announced seven roads in 2009, and as of this year, now 10 years later, two of them had been committed by the previous government. That was the um, Victoria Park Tunnel and Waterview. Um, but so, so let's say they, they announced five roads. They haven't even, I mean, they haven't even been completed after nine years. And during that time, they didn't maintain our roads to the standard. They, they cut funding for police and road safety. The road tolls started to increase in 2013. Um, you know, so <laughs> I, I, I think that what's been run here is a national party line that imagines that somehow they had enough money without putting up petrol tax to build a bunch of new roads and that they'd all be built in the next five years. That's, that it's just absurd. Um, but what we have done, and I'm really proud of this, is we've increased funding for road police. We've uh, maintained and renewed 2,000 kilometers of state highway alone just in the last year and a half that would not have been done under the previous government. We've got safety improvements going on over 3,000 kilometers of state highway and local roads that will prevent 160 serious injuries and deaths per year. Um, so we've got a huge program on improving our roads. And Rail is part of improving the functioning of our road, ne road network. There's, it's a no-brainer. Most, most New Zealanders understand this. Um, we've got the rail line sitting there. Uh, if it can carry more goods and more people, that's fewer vehicles on the road, that makes the road work better. And uh, so why wouldn't we be using all of our infrastructure and assets? We will, of course, we are building roads. There are at least um, 10 that are, that are being built right now, not to mention, you know, Manawatu Gorge, uh, Mount Messenger. There's a number in Auckland. I don't have the list in front of me because that's not what this interview was supposed to be about. But I can assure you that there is plenty of investment going on in our road network. But what it is, is ensuring that all of our roads, are well-maintained and safe and function well, that people have real alternatives in our towns and cities, which is where the majority of people live, uh, because that's what, that's what makes the whole system work well. And that if, you, if any Kiwi goes to another country, they see rail. They see how well it works. They, they also have a lot more people living there. They have a, a, a rail uh, passenger network, which is economical because there's more people who live there and more people, therefore, who can use it. Talking oh, of please, EVs... Please tell me...
me how it's any different having a larger population, maintaining a large windy road network and maintaining a functional rail network. We had a fantastic rail network when New Zealand had a million people and it was it was economically viable. So uh, I doubt it. Myth. We've never had an economically viable rail network in this country because of the geography of it. You take the investment that even Julius Vogel made back in the 19th century into it. We've never had an economical rail network in this country because NZ Rail well, in the country that we grew up in was always running at a huge network. loss and was so always heavily subsidised. We're, we're, we are almost 5 million people. We, we do have a growing population. I think anyone knows, no matter what country you go to, even smaller countries have really well-balanced transport, transport systems, well-maintained and safe roads. Um, and rail is part of that. It makes economic sense um, if you aren't, you know, just repeating our parroting talking points. I mean, like, it's just silly. It's silly the idea that somehow it would be more economical to move everything on road and have to import all of our vehicles and fuel to run them than to use the assets that we already have. That well, the problem is you cannot put passenger trains on our rail network. You can't put well, economic passenger trains on our rail network, and that's been <laughs> proved for 150 years. Um, that's, I don't know what you're talking about because we have passenger trains and we, we also have very economical freight rail already. And that's with under Well, the fact that we have passenger trains, they just don't make any money. That's all. Okay. Uh, Listen, talking of EVs. I'm sorry. I've been on the phone 15 minutes. I have to go. I have another meeting. Nice to talk to you. Thank you, Julianne Jeddah.